Is your bank or credit union ready for tomorrow? Are you adapting to the latest trends and demands? Don't let changes in your market catch you by surprise. In this episode of Training Matters, we talk about transforming your branches and staff to keep up with the customer's ever-changing expectations and needs. I'm your host, Honey Shelton, and this is Training Matters. Training Matters is brought to you by the Training Institute, dedicated to setting the standard for individuals responsible for training effectiveness in banks and credit unions across the country. Happy New Year. Welcome, everyone. In this first episode of 2016, our guest is the exceptional Joe Sullivan. Joe is the expert on future-proofing and adapting your bank or credit union to a market that's changing at lightning speeds. Joe, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Honey, I would be glad to, and thank you once again for inviting me to the program. I am, as Honey mentioned, I'm Joe Sullivan, CEO of Chicago-based Market Insights, and we are a consulting firm specializing in helping banks and credit unions with assessing their marketplace in terms of demographics and data and information and helping them to assess their delivery system. So what to do in terms of the branch, the online experience, the mobile interface, the website, and to help these banks and credit unions position themselves and make sure that the delivery system is in line with the marketplace. We do a lot of planning work and marketing and branding work, but the core of it is about understand your marketplace and recraft the delivery system for a new and changing marketplace with different consumer behaviors and preferences. Well, great, Joe. I know that uh, our listeners are concerned every day about the very things you talked about that your company helps them resolve. Why don't we just dive right in and hear what your thoughts are on what's happening in the branch delivery side? How is it transforming? Okay, honey, I want to first of all mention this is a subject near and dear to my heart and not just because of the work that we do Uh, with roughly 375 financial institutions across the country. But this word, you know, evolution, I think is at the center of it. Because we have been moving for the last 10 or 15 years, not just since the Great Recession, into a changing role and purpose and function of the branch. Again, I want to make sure I'm addressing your question here, but what we're seeing overall is that there are going to be fewer bank branches or credit union branches, and I might use the term bankers here to collectively describe anyone that works at a bank or a credit union, by the way. Uh, They're going to be smaller in terms of square footage. They're going to be more focused on sales with technology being used as a way to alleviate the traditional transactions that were done by a teller to free up the staff for more engaging activities. This is an industry that is overbuilt relative to branches, During the 90s and the 2000s, really the past two decades, there was an escalation in that due to changes in banking laws. You know that well coming from the state of Texas, how that changed things. But I know that the listeners on this program already know that. So how does a banker credit union get off the dime and start down this path with what I suspect they know is necessary and strategically vital? So I've been talking about this for, I mean, the last 10 years, but for the last three and a half years, it's been escalating in terms of the work that we do. And the urgency is building for banks and credit unions to really address what to do with this physical bricks and mortar part. Well, Joe, like you, I hear a lot of conversation about this as well. One question that I have for you, the community bank that serves both rural America as well as metropolitan cities, is the transformation of branches that are moving towards smaller square footage, the sales piece and so forth that you mentioned, do you see that a bank or a credit union should look at their entire footprint and change it exclusively? Or are you recommending that they tier in or Where do they really begin? Well, we do, and I'm not trying to make this sound like a sales pitch in any way, we do a delivery optimization study for many of the financial institutions, and they've got to look at all their markets. So whether 
a market is in a rural environment or a small town or in an urban area where you have people walking by as opposed to driving in, the urgency of rethinking that branch is the same regardless of environment. That there is less traffic coming in, people are coming there for different things because they can kick tear up their deposit relationship via their mobile app or things like that. So the functions are changing regardless of the environment that you're in. And a credit union or a bank must look at the entire delivery system and all the markets. And what we generally say is that, you know, look, there's not an unlimited pool of capital here. You know, your listeners today may be saying, this is great, some of the things that we may talk about in the next few minutes, but we can't afford this. So what we generally say is to pick your markets with the greatest potential for deposit, loan, and maybe investment services growth. So pick your branch markets where there's the greatest growth potential and look at the ones with the highest transaction volumes and look at things like that and say, pick one as a starting point to treat as a pilot. And then you can roll out and you can sequentially evolve the other locations and channels as need be and work it out over, say, a three to four year period of time. Well, that certainly makes sense. And I I do like the plan, do, check approach where you were saying the most ideal branch for adapting it to what's happening in the marketplace and and see how that works. Let's say that, uh, that you think back at a client that did what you just said. How did it impact how many people worked at that location and what they paid people at that location and how they retrofitted the physical side of that branch to be a state-of-the-art branch? Good question. First of all, I want to go back and add one comment to what we talked about previously that, you know, you mentioned of small towns and so forth, and we also see playing out there. You know, roughly 40% of the counties in the United States have lost population in the last 10 years. And so many of our listeners here today might also be wondering, it's not a matter of whether I have branch with great growth potential. It's about whether I can consolidate two locations in small towns with negative population and people leaving and consolidate that perhaps into one more centrally located market that's smaller and more tech focused. So there's several different strategic objectives for why a bank or a credit union would look at this and decide whether they need to evolve. But um, getting back, and I want to make sure that I remember all the parts of your question, I think you said what's the impact on, on the staffing and what's the impact on what was the other factor? Just the physicality of retrofitting a branch to the new model. Well, the reality is that in a perfect world, we'll start there, a full-service branch, and we talk about various different types of branch from an ATM to a small vestibule to a hybrid banking center to a full-service, and a full-service branch going forward is going to be roughly 2,500 square feet or less. And again, most branches in the country right now are still far bigger than that. So retrofitting doesn't mean you lop off a third of it, put up a wall, and lease it off. That's not always feasible. So what we do is, is I think you've got to look and say, How is the customer experience inside of a branch changing or how must it change based on the market? So retrofitting might be a migration of tellers to universal bankers. Retrofitting might mean that you have to change the staffing model in a given location and you need to have a mortgage lender at one location but not another. You know, again, it varies depending on the market. And I want to go back and say, First of all, some of the questions that you're asking here, we make the fundamental assumption or request with our clients that you cannot address this kind of change until you assess the marketplace, until you know what the demographic trajectory is of your market, until you know what the profile is of the customers that are assigned to that location and who transacts there and who doesn't but simply is assigned there. You must mine the data, assess the market, look at the demographics, look at the segments, and figure out what kind of growth potential that you have at a given location. So here's a point. We finished up a project in, I'll just say, in the, in the upper Midwest. And this bank was not pleased because the deposit performance and growth at six or eight of these branches were very, very low. And what we found out in assessing the market is that they're not deposit branches at all. They're markets for investments and commercial. So the paradigm through which this bank was thinking about success at a branch 
was based on the deposit teller transaction model. So that's my long-winded way of saying you've got to understand the kind of market potential that is in a branch before you can decide how it must evolve. Great information and, and so true. Uh, knowing your market, knowing your customer, uh, looking at trends, traffic patterns. Years ago, when I was first a banker involved in the marketing side, we looked really hard at those things, but there weren't 12 branches of competitors already in the marketplace like we see today. Right. You know, what I'm hearing you say is that there's not a quick fix. It's a thorough investigation of where you are, what your situation is, what the outcome is. And I loved your comment about the paradigm that you judge a branch according to teller transactions. And that traffic, that deposit traffic is very retail thinking, of course, but I can see how complex the research has to be to make a solid decision about what are we going to look like and does that look match what's really needed in the markets we serve. Am I getting that right, Joe? Yes, you are. And for example, that bank I mentioned in the upper Midwest, they were sitting on a variable gold mine. This is a bank that was retail in nature that had in the last five or six years gone more toward commercial like many institutions have. They had a solid sales team in place. They had the sales mechanism, the referral, the back office, everything set up. And we said, and you're looking at these branches in the market saying they're not successful, yet you're booking millions and millions and millions of dollars in mortgages and commercial. So change the model. Take the model of your staffing of these specialists that you put them on the road with a cell phone and iPad and do the same thing for the other product lines. But we could not have made that recommendation to them had we not assessed their market, evaluated their customer base, and done a detailed segmentation analysis, assessed the competition, looked at product behavior, forecasted out potential, and helped them to prioritize. We, as an industry, we still evaluate based on deposit success. And, you know, many, many thought leaders out there have talked about the demise of the branch, and I don't go as far as, as a greatly, a really wonderful guy named Brett King who says they're all going to be gone very shortly, but I do say that they are changing. So what I want the listener today to think is we must rethink success in terms of the branch paradigm. And with this industry that's focused on deposit growth, lobby traffic, and transactions, instead of engagement, problem solving, and true relationship building. So that's probably the one sentence I think if everybody's listening today, I think is the most important thing. The second part is marketing. Let me tell you a story. We are in the middle of several delivery network optimization studies for banks, one with five locations, one with about 15, one with about 65, and it keeps going from there. And so we did a, a visit to some branches last week, and we visited with 11 branches. And virtually every branch manager, because we get in there and we talk to them, we look at the physical space, we look at how they staff it, we look at their hours, we look at how they're merchandising and communicating their message and all that. Every one of those branch managers said, you know, we need more marketing. And it occurred to me that, again, the branch managers are still thinking that the success that we have we must have marketing and put an ad in the paper and all of this mostly outdated marketing is what it's going to take to get this branch to succeed when instead we have got to focus on engagement. So that is a word that needs to be at the center of training. How do we engage consumers across all the channels, whether it's the branch, whether it's the mobile app, whether it's calling into a call center for problem, we must not product push. So. This idea of marketing, which could bring us off into a whole other set of radio programs, we've got to rethink it because banks are still spending way too much money on the wrong kind of marketing. And I haven't even addressed social media, but until we engage people as human beings, that's not going to succeed. Think of your own experience, whether it's been a good restaurant or a good retailer that you go to. I'm guessing honey, that you have some level of connection or engagement with that person, team or restaurant. Would that be fair? Absolutely fair. Okay. So then, you know, just kind of summarizing some main points, rethinking success, marketing, moving toward engagement and less product pushing and so forth. 
the better use of customer and market data is critical. Now, I've kind of already mentioned that under Know Your Market, but you know, we are moving into a time where data analytics, demographics, segmentation, we're moving toward one-to-one -one marketing, but banks, to quote the gentleman from um, Marquis at some point, he said, you know, forget the words big data, just use the data that you have. And that's a very, very good thing. So that's kind of the third thing I think that, you know, how do community banks respond to the evolution? They rethink success, they reevaluate marketing and move it towards more engagement, they use and better use more and aligned customer and market data, they realign their product suite. They need to simplify it. We just finished a project where a fairly good sized bank had like seven retail checking products and four commercial checking products. A bank does not need 11 choices for checking products and consumers don't want that. So even the product suite and everything, it's not just honey about the bricks and mortar. It's not just about that piece. All of these fit together. And then finally, rethink the staffing model. And I know that you had some questions that you wanted to address on that, but I'll, I'll start with kind of the summary that we must evolve from transaction to interaction with better trained, more highly paid people and shedding the teller low paid mentality that this industry has been plagued with for decades. Well, I just want to stand up and clap and applaud because it is so true that this idea of focusing on transaction versus knowing your customer, finding new customers, expanding the relationship is uh, where we've missed the boat. It sounds like to me that what your data that you're using and your experience is telling you is that indeed the customer experience is up for grabs in my audiences, since we both are circuit speakers, Joe, you know, that's one of the ways I get my research. For example, I'll have everybody in a room stand up that's had a transaction with Amazon in the last 60 days. Right. That's everybody in the room. And, you know, honey, the other thing that, okay, we've, we've both been at this for a while. Um, I've seen you on the speaker circuit. You've seen me out there. And, you know, when I first started at this, I won't say what year to date myself too much here, but... You know, we've been talking about the shift to a sales culture. We've been talking about making connections with customers for decades. Mm -hmm. But the change has now happened that banks can no longer make money doing it the way that they've done, or they can't make the kind of profit margins that they were. And so part of the evolution is now finally being driven by economic necessity. Because another point I want to make on the front end, and maybe you know some of our listeners here are saying, how do I bring this to my management team? The transaction-oriented, staff-heavy, branch-dependent business model is economically unsustainable. That's a pretty strong statement. And there, there's just no question that having a presence in the market used to give you the leg up, if you will. It was all about location. And today, with early on, you mentioned all these different methods that a customer can have an experience today and get a problem resolved and uh, make life easier for them. In light of that, I think uh, we've been so late to address the branch because we've thought, how can I catch up with technology? I see where you led us to that it is so true that our listeners can help motivate or inspire change at their companies by taking some of these ideas that you shared where what is the data telling us? Uh, what is the profitability of our branches? And who are we really servicing and how? Do you want to empower yourself with the confidence and skills to excel as a trainer? If you are serious about training, Train the Trainer Bootcamp is for you. Join us February 23rd to February 26th in Houston, Texas to boost your credibility and speaking skills as a trainer. Train the Trainer Bootcamp is a dynamic four-day workshop every trainer deserves. You'll learn from the nation's best trainers on how to engage your audience and make training stick. Learn more at interaction-training.com February 23rd 
to the 26th, 2016. Save the date. Sign up today. I want to go back to a couple of things, Joe. Let's just picture that this is a bank that signed up or a credit union that said, yes, the data shows us we've got to make some changes. When you walk in the door of a branch that has made it through the revolution or the evolution, tell me what it's going to look like. Tell me who's going to work there. All right. Number one. The issue of location, location, location has never been more true than now, so I'll start there and work our way inside. The irony is that in the kind of the technology world, we layered all of the different technology channels on top of the branch, and if a bank or a credit union is, is going to commit to having a bricks and mortar presence, it had better be a rock star location because it's the physical landing page for their brand. So as I mentioned before, it's going to be smaller. And there's going to be fewer of them. According to SNL data from 2014 to 2015, the United States had a net loss of 1,600 branches, and that's just in one year. And so I mentioned, you know, I'll get into later if you want me to, there's different branch types. But when we walk in that transformed, that evolved branch, I'm not going to see a teller line. I'm going to see three or four, perhaps at the most, well-trained, universal specialists who are trained in loans and deposits, can open up new accounts, have credit authority based on graded level and so forth, can get the accounts open, can address commercial, can address retail, can address problem solving, and it's going to be in a collaborative working environment. If a customer does want to do a traditional transaction, there will be a self-service area that might be a next generation ATM, it might mean a video ATM, but it gives the customer the choice to bank on their terms, and if they don't want to talk to you or me inside the branch, they can go over to the left side or the right side of the vestibule and take care of their transaction by themselves. But inside, those three to four people I mentioned, they're all trained the same way, and they're all handling a book of business, and they're all salespeople and problem solvers and consultants. You know, there is going to be more tech-enabled. We just finished a project in Wisconsin where it's going to be trained using iPads and things like that. So the technology uh, will be there. There will be cash recyclers in some of these locations if there is a need for cash and things like that. So smaller, an area for self-service, there will be different zones of engagement. The self-service zone, the interaction between banker and customer zone, and what I call the empowerment zone. And the empowerment zone is where customers get a chance to see what's possible through planning tools and visuals and, and charting out financial plans and things they can do with technology tools and people. Did that address the question for you? It did. Yes, it, it absolutely did address it. I liked how you brought up the uh, idea or the concept of zones. That helps me see it uh, pretty clearly. And you also mentioned these people are going to be well-trained, highly versatile, well-paid. Am I getting all that right, Joe? Yes, you are, because uh, the other point I mentioned in there is that we've always viewed the teller as the low man or woman on the totem pole. We pay them the least, but they have the most, co the most connection. So if as an industry, banks and credit unions want to attract people to work in the industry, then you need to upgrade the whole role of what is possible. And so I think we're trying to address also attracting people to work in the industry. And the only way you're going to do that, um, staying within the confines of what we're talking about here, is to upgrade those roles because somebody getting out of college today, if they've got a choice to work at Amazon or some other tech company, why would they want to work for a bank or credit unit? There's a lot of reasons why, and part of the changes that you make are based on that. So what's the forecast uh, in five years or 10 years about the number of branches if we had a net loss, I believe you said, of 1,600 last year? Yes, that's right. In previous years, it's been about 1,000. So even in some of my recent evolution of branch delivery speeches, when we pulled the data from the year before, it was about 1,000 or 1,100. So we're escalating. It's coming up. You're going to see an escalation of closures because 42 cents on roughly every dollar, again, that depends on the institution, comes from maintaining branches. So if a branch, a bank with eight locations can get by with six and they're smaller and more tech-focused, they might pay more for staff but they pay less for physical premise location and so forth. 
So I think if you conservatively multiply 1,600 times five, that's 9,000 or 8,000 branches less in five years than we have now. And I, don't, I do not think that that is unrealistic whatsoever. And Joe, just uh, you know, to nitpick it a little bit, there's still new branches being opened. There are, and many of them are different. We have a project going on right now where given the market they serve, they need deposits. And we are addressing them with the online you know, opening of the accounts and things like that, but they need some physical branches. Given the configuration of the markets and how bad traffic is and how many different neighborhoods and urban, suburban areas, we've determined that they need three physical new locations to effectively serve the market that they're in. And so there is a purpose. I do not believe in the idea of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. As long as there is a functional strategic purpose for a branch, then fine. Many of the banks and credit unions, they're putting them out there for very specific reasons, whether it's we need deposit gathering hubs to feed an ever-growing loan demand. We need to have transactional convenience or relational convenience, I should say, for a different demographic than what we're serving right now. But many of the credit unions or banks that are adding branches are doing it, whether it might be a geographic fill-in, they're changing two branches that are out of date and old and too expensive to remodel, and they're replacing it with one new one that's smaller and more tech-focused. So yes, there is indeed branching because we are seeing not only an evolution, it is a realignment. And we have often said, getting back to the comment where I said, a branch is a physical landing page, the experience of your brand as a financial institution. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, there are way too many locations in this country that are horrible, whether it's bad ingress and egress, out of date physical location, where there is not enough market potential for growth to justify spending $700 million in a remodel. So you are seeing a realignment where many of the banks and credit unions that we work with that have anywhere from say four to 20 branches, they're the ones doing the most realignment. Because if we take Bank of America out of it, because they're closing many and, and things like that, which they should probably, but these smaller institutions have got to make sure that every location is profitable. And if you have, say, 10 locations and two of them are not profitable, you need to figure out why. And sometimes the market has shifted. The market has shifted five miles to the west. There is still a geographic component to this, but you will see branches go in. They will be with a purpose. A lot of them will be focused around lending or investments or what I call boutiques but they're not generally for deposits unless it's handled by a teller pod and cash recyclers. Well, great. What I hear you saying is it's been on a roll and now it's uh, gaining momentum, that this change is real. We're going to see more of it. Talk a little bit about the interactive uh, teller, video teller, ATM. A lot of our listeners may not have actually even seen one, or don't understand how it works. Tell us how it works. Okay, uh, let's describe it a little bit. And again, um, it's ironic how there have not that that has not been adopted faster than it has. But picture an ATM with a large video screen on it. That, I'm oversimplifying here, but I think it proves the point. And I can walk up to that machine regardless of where it's placed, and I will have the option just like I do whether I scan my thumbprint or I put in my card to get authenticated. I connect with my bank. I will have the opportunity now through a video screen, just like we do on Skype and FaceTime and all of that, to talk to a banker. And that's the difference. And the idea is, you know, think of the old drive-up teller technology where you had those companies that were offering you, where you could see your bank teller when you were in the drive through It is not unlike that. And, and forgive me if I'm giving you an outdated example on that. But the video teller, um, I have some specific comments about that. I would rather say video banker, and here's why. I think that the branch is a training ground for a much broader execution of this concept. And by that, I mean that right now we have a, a financial institution client that is using that technology to make available consumer lending, the application process, the assistance process with getting the loan done, and all the interactions between with their customer is handled via video banking. Um, you know, years ago now, like three or four years now, the concept of telemedicine has been gaining in popularity. And, and as we new, renew our health plans and all that stuff every year, your health insurance company is probably saying to you, hey, if you have a cold or the flu, why not just log in and talk to your doctor over a video screen instead of having to get in the car and drive to the office when you feel terrible? 
So that same concept, I think that the, the video tellers inside the branch, I think what it's doing is training customers to be able to talk to their banker about investment services or commercial or mortgages or some kind of sophisticated product that they're looking at. And I think that having them in the branch for the time being is going to get com customers comfortable with that idea. And that concept, and this is my opinion here, is going to be uh, rolled out at call centers across the country or the world for that matter. And why shouldn't it be that Bank ABC in Houston, Texas, for example, there isn't one that I know of, I'm making that up, um, that they could have investment services or mortgages and so forth staffed by people in a centralized call center where they can reach bankers or customers, excuse me, all across their footprint. Mm -hmm. So that was a rather long-winded way of saying that I think that the real gold is in the higher revenue products where a customer and a banker can talk to each other via a video screen. We do it now everywhere else. I think that just having video tellers is just a way for banking to get started. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Do you see that transferring over to the mobile experience? Yes, I do. And as a matter of fact, I gave a recent presentation. I think it was in Texas, as a matter of fact. And in my research, I found a mobile app that's already doing that. And I believe, and I, I'm going to have to be quoted on this, it's called Linkto, L-I-N-Q-T-O. It allows a banker to deliver a video experience to a customer in a mobile app. And so part of me, honey, is wondering why we're putting video tellers inside a branch instead of investing in the technology to get it delivered mobily and on our iPad or put it in markets or shopping centers or places where the bank doesn't have a presence but wants one. I agree. The conversion rate of users, I think, will happen very quickly. Um, I think for the community bank, one of the challenges and I'm sure you help them with this, is that they're often at the mercy of their core processor that can adapt their network to this product. Do you run into that, where that, that's part of the trouble? You bet we do. Even sometimes when we ask a client to, at the beginning of an engagement, um, pull a customer address file for us so we can do some segmentation or something like that, um, and this came up in the, in the webinar I did on Tuesday on this very subject, and that is an issue. And the only thing that I can say that we've seen some of our clients do is renegotiate their contract, be more aggressive with their provider, because the technology is out there, and if it's not their provider, it might be another one. Because that has been a stumbling block, and this is where banks, they're just being almost demanded uh, to spend this kind of money to get the right technology infrastructure in place so that they can deliver all the other mobile and all the interfaces the way the customers want it. So it's a necessary expenditure. In some ways, it's a necessary evil. I, I say that in a good way. Uh, but yes, the core processor has been a huge issue with many of the banks and the credit unions that we have talked to. Well, Joe, this was uh, very insightful, exciting. I'm sure for some of our listeners, um, surprising to some degree when we sit here talking about that the way that you're going to see growth in the future is not by having more locations, but by having a well thought out strategy that puts you in touch with your customer the way they want to be in touch with you. And, and I think that's going to be the, the real change that we're going to see going forward. Well, before we close, I want you to tell our listeners if they wanted to know more about you or to be in touch with you, how can they do that? Honey, thank you. First of all, you can go to our website, uh, www.4marketinsights, that's F-O-R, the word market, the word insights.com. And on there, we have a, a blog and several other tabs of information that you can look at. You can reach me on Twitter at M-I underscore Sullivan. And I'm also on LinkedIn as well and so forth. And my email is jsullivan at 4marketinsights. I would just like to leave, uh, we do this kind of work, helping the banks and the credit unions understand the market and recraft the delivery system. But I'll leave you with a few summary points. Rethink success in terms of what the branch paradigm is all about. Rethink your marketing and make it more about engagement and less product pushing. Use more effective your customer and market data. Realign your product suite 
and rethink your staffing model and evolve that from transaction to interaction. And these are all great bullet points to you, but how do you do this? You do it by starting by looking at the markets and say, how do we pay for this? We pay for some of these changes that we must make by identifying the markets that give us the greatest potential lift. And that's also the way that you speak to your CEO and your board, because he or she will understand that if they're where they see the economic payoff. So you must prioritize where and when you evolve based on the market and the market potential. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to our episode today. Be sure and check out Joe's website. Definitely sign up for his blog. I can see how he could help many of you make some extremely critical decisions for the future. I want to thank Joe again and all of you for tuning in. You've been listening to Training Matters with Honey Shelton.